There's our first one, Mr. Craig. Again, I'm not going all the way through. Are you one? Look at you. There you go. Two? Perfect. Yeah, go ahead and throw them back. We know our numbers, right? <laughs> okay, are we, we're just going to be passing the mics, correct, back and forth? Is there a We're going to share, right? Okay, so we will go in order. This will be for you. And um, the first question came from Wise Republican Party. In response to the 2020 lockdown orders, do you believe that Wise County did a good job? Why or why not? If our state or federal government issues another mandate to lock down our country due to what they call epidemic, would you comply? What will your response be to this action? So, the county's response, it, I think, was a good response. In the immediate aftermath of the declaration and the lockdown, uh, there was a lot of confusion, a lot of things that we did not know. But as quickly as that started to um, clear up, the confusion started to clear up, we didn't enforce mandates. We didn't enforce lockdowns. Uh, mandates and lockdowns aren't criminal laws. Mandates and lockdowns are wonderful. However, that's not something that the sheriff's office went about the business of forcing people to, to comply with, to close down businesses, to behave a certain way. That's what, not what a sheriff's office in Texas does. Uh, we did not do that then, and we will not do that again. Thank you. Time? Perfect. And just to reiterate, the time will be right in front of you. We should have said that before. <laughs> so you did perfect. Thank you so much, Craig. I appreciate it. Carrie? So I don't think we did a good job. I don't think the state did a good job. I am a constitutionalist. I do not believe that the governor had the right to shut us down, close our churches, forbid us to go worship. That was a big mistake. He is correct. A mandate is not a law. I would also not if there was any mandates. Uh, we needed the church then and now, right? So we learned a lot from COVID. We learned a lot of things that we should never do again and expect that the government will try to pull the same stuff again. So that's my position as a constitutional conservative. Thank you. Thank you. No, I, I, we would not attempt in any way to enforce any kind of federal mandates, nor do I think the sheriff's office should require their deputies to wear masks while they were on duty. All of that should have been personal preference, their own safety, however they felt they needed to protect themselves. And I would suggest that the public should have felt the same way. If you felt the need to wear a mask, wear one. If you felt the need to get the shot, which I didn't recommend, don't get it, or get it, whichever was your preference. I chose not to. Uh, at the time, it wasn't required at the sheriff's office to take that shot, but they highly recommended it, and I refused. I would not have, I would not get it, I still refuse. Thank you. Thank you, Wesley. Well, in regards to uh, I agree with what Craig says. It's not the sheriff's office job to enforce the, the masks or anything else for the quarantine start. Uh, it is, it is I, I personally feel that the government kind of scared everybody. Uh, they provided uh, different things, wanting us to uh, the masks, shutdowns, everything else. That was, I, I feel personally, it was not appropriate. Uh, it's just like a, a flu. I think they, they overemphasized the COVID situation. We still have the COVID situation today, but it's not as, it's not as bad, they say, as it is currently. But it's not our job 
as law enforcement to enforce people staying home, people wearing masks. That's not our job, and we should not even be involved in that. That's, that's not for us to be enforcing. Thank you very much. Um, I do want to give the gentleman a moment. You have one minute to do an introduction. We should have done that at the beginning. So again, first time. <laughs> if you would stand and give your uh, one minute speech, please, an introduction, and again, our timekeeper. Thank you. I am Craig Johnson. I'm the current Chief Deputy Sheriff at the Wise County Sheriff's Office. Uh, for those of y'all not familiar with the chain of command of the Sheriff's Office, that's second in command of, of the Sheriff's Office. We have 150 employees. Uh, they are the best women and men in law enforcement, first responders and communications in jail that you will ever find. Uh, we serve without personal agenda. We walk beneath the banner of public trust and we are not um, people who will not pay attention to the Constitution and uphold the rule of law. Those are things that we have stood for, those are things that we do stand for, and those things are things that we will stand for. We didn't lock down or force anybody to do anything during the lockdown for COVID. It is a personal choice. I completely agree there. If it's your choice to wear a mask, please do. If it's your choice to be vaccinated, please do. If it's your choice not to be, please don't. There is nothing wrong with that. It doesn't make you less than or better. Thank you. Thank you so much. Kerry? So my name is Kerry Melina. Uh, one minute to tell everybody what, about your background is, is kind of hard to unpack. But I'm a military veteran. I spent eight years active duty Air Force. I spent six years overseas, two years here in the States. Uh, my background is I am president and uh, general manager of a company out of the Great Line. Uh, I spent 33 years running the business and we sold it about two and a half years ago. Uh, we turned a small family business into a very lucrative business. Um, I am currently Chief Deputy Constable under Constable Applewhite. Uh, I am a masterpiece officer, just like my, my friends behind me. Um, it's all about the Constitution, folks. It's all about getting out there and understanding the rules and, and abiding by the rules. So. Uh, your vote would be greatly appreciated. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gary. Wesley? I'm Wesley Hughes. I'm currently a sergeant of Sanderson Park Police Department. I have been in law enforcement now for going on 20 years, anniversary this year. I, most of you are very concerned about constitutional rights, and I understand that. But we were, when we swore our oaths as peace officers, it was to defend that Constitution. And I take that very seriously. I don't want to, any of your rights to be any infringed upon any more than I would want my own. So I am here for you. Um, I spent 10 years at the sheriff's office, and there was not much there that I was not involved in. Everything from being a patrol sergeant there to the range master, firearms instructor, instructor for many things there, as well as field training officer, and training the, the deputies that came through. But right now, I'm out of time. <laughs> Thank you, Wesley. My name is Rex Oskins. I'm currently the Constable Precinct 1 Wise County. Uh, before that, I was the, I worked with the City of Decatur for 38 years. 37 years of that, I was the Chief of Police in Decatur. Uh, I started my career at Dallas Police Department. Went from there to Wise County Sheriff's Office where I worked as a jailer and then uh, patrol deputy into an investigator where I was. Back when I went to work at the Sheriff's Office, we were stationed at different uh, towns. Newark was my first town I was stationed at. Uh, Rome was the second. I worked at Bridgeport. Uh, I worked at TDC. Uh, and I had very good knowledge of law enforcement and I prolonged my whole career and life for law enforcement. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can we give these gentlemen a round of applause?
This question is from South Wise Republican Club. What role should the Sheriff's Department play in addressing human trafficking? And that will go to you, Carrie, and we'll loop all the way around. I'll ask the question one more time. What role should the Sheriff's Department play in addressing human trafficking? That's a great question. Human trafficking is truly the evil of our time. Uh, Tarrant County, uh, Collin County are deeply involved in uh, the Yonko Boyens Ministry, which I did a seminar about six weeks ago with that ministry. That ministry is 100% committing to saving children before they are trafficked. I believe the Wise County Sheriff's Office should be deeply involved in this, this true evil. Uh, by the way, I'm going to have another non-political seminar in Aurora on February 8th. That's coming. But every month I go to Yaku Boyne's ministry for updates on what's going on. Uh, they are truly a blessing to have. And I would suggest that you guys go there to their website and, and check out their, their ministry. Thank you very much. Thank you, Carrie. Wesley? Well, human trafficking has been an issue nationwide, not and worldwide, as far as that goes. But what we do, or what the sheriff's office does, in, in reference to this, is largely falls upon their interdiction people, their SED division. Those guys get out on the highway. They're the ones that are attempting to not only uh, get drugs off of our streets that are coming across the border, but they're also out there trying to catch human trafficking as well. Any any kind of serious crimes like that, that's what they're doing full time. That's what those guys do as a full time job at the sheriff's office. And if you see them out on the highway, they're not out there just to catch speeders. They're out there trying to do that. Get those drugs, get the Human trafficking, slow that stuff down. They're also trying to catch money that the cartel sending back to Mexico. Thank, Thank you. you, Wesley. Rex? Human trafficking is definitely a serious problem that's developed in this country. Uh, the sheriff's office should be involved uh, as much as possible with it. We uh, need to partner with our other cities, other federal uh, agencies to get it done, uh, it's, it's, a, it's not just on the highways, it's, you've got to, we have a life, I don't give you an example, Walmart, uh, people asking for food and stuff like that, there's human traffic involved in that. So the, the sheriff's office needs to be directly involved in that, and I think right now they're addressing that issue and part of it, but, but we can always improve. Thank you. Thank you, Max. Craig? Human trafficking is a terrible, terrible thing. Uh, human trafficking is not just stopping people on the highway. The roots of human trafficking uh, appear in some families, maybe even in communities that we all live in, the different cities, the different areas. It's not simply a standard law enforcement, stop a car and search it. Sure, that's going to, to find it sometime. Sometimes investigators find it during their investigations, crimes against persons, oftentimes. Oftentimes, patrol deputies find it. What we've done at the sheriff's office is we use a multi-pronged approach and enable our folks to take the action that is necessary, and we have worked hard to establish a children's advocacy center to help us with different resources to help identify not only the problem, but get resources for the benefit of the victims and help us get this epidemic under control. Those are things that we have done and we will continue to do and work with our federal partners and state partners. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, this will go to you, Wesley. Um, it's a long question, so let me get it out and then I'll, I'll hand it off to you if you don't mind. As a, and this is from the Patriots Society of Boy, as a Texas peace officer, one of your jobs is to protect the citizens of your county against government overreach. Article 1, Section 23 of the Texas Constitution states, every citizen shall have the right to keep and bear arms in lawful defense of himself or the state. If the federal government banned firearms, 
such as handguns or AR rifles, including high capacity magazines with 10 or more rounds, what is your position? Enjoy. <laughs> okay. Well, I, I mentioned earlier that I was the range master for the county, so I am a big, I am a firearms guy. Might say a firearms nut. And I have my shirt, fair share of guns, and I believe in keeping them. And I can promise you this, nobody's taking my guns. Nobody. And nobody's gonna, I'm not gonna help anybody take yours either. Okay? Simple answer. Thank you, Wesley. Rex? My personal opinion is we all have the right to have our guns. That should take them away for our government. And then my, my, my philosophy is we would not enforce anything like that in this, in this county or in this state for that. Because as our constitution and everything else, we have that right and we shouldn't let them take that away from us. And I strongly believe in that and I, I think that's what we need to honor. Right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Craig? I think you'll be hard pressed to find any of the four of us up here that have a drastically different answer. <laughs> because quite frankly, as someone who believes in the Constitution and upholds the rule of law, why would, why would we ever step back and abdicate the responsibility and authority that we have as a sheriff's office and as a sheriff to come in and take uh, things away from us? What would be next? You know, flip phones, flip phones have gone by the way of carbon paper and the dodo bird, but you know, if you choose something else to take, that could be an issue. The direct answer to the question is no, we will not enforce that. No, as sheriff, I will not be part of that. No, as sheriff, I do not think that would be an appropriate way for a government to behave and we will not be a part of that. As a sheriff, I serve you, all of you, whether we agree on everything or disagree on everything, and we will not do that. That's the level of service we provide now and the level of service that we will continue to provide in the future. Thank you, Craig. Craig? Ditto. Yeah. So, I'm a lifetime NRA member. I was a licensed to carry instructor. I was the first licensed to carry instructor at Bass Pro back in the day. I was the first licensed to carry instructor at Cabela's, and once Cabela's and Bass Pro found out that I was doing both, they said, you know, what do you got to leave? So I took the one with the range. Uh, again, lifetime member of the NRA, I, I am more Second Amendment than the average human being, I think. Like these gentlemen, we, we all love our firearms, and we want to make sure that you guys keep your firearms as well. There is nothing in the Constitution that says we need to be taking your firearms because the federal government says so. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kerry. Okay, Rex, this is for you. A little shorter. Wise County Conservatives, based on your understanding of the U.S. Constitution, in what circumstances can a state lawfully nullify a federal action, written law or policy? <laughs> Happy to, I'll stand right here. Please. Based on your understanding of the U.S. Constitution, in what circumstances can a state lawfully nullify a federal action, written law, or policy? Very good question. <laughs> I'm going to have to say, I can't tell you that, to be honest with you. I don't know. Fair enough, thank you so much. Craig? Will you repeat that one more time? I'd be happy to. <laughs> Based on your understanding of the U.S. Constitution, in what circumstances can a state lawfully nullify a federal action, written law or policy? When can the state nullify? A federal action, written law or policy. Paul Governor. Paul Governor. That's, that's not a one-minute answer. Um, the, the simple 
the simple, concise answer that I can give you that best reflects the answer to that is if those reflect illegal actions, something that infringes on our rights, something that is treasonous, and something, something that violates the very spirit of the Constitution itself. Well said. <laughs> Thank you so much, Frank. Again, would you like me to repeat oh, it? I got it. <laughs> so it's Tenth Amendment, right? The Constitution says that the federal government works for us. They work for the state. It's the Tenth Amendment. If the, if the federal government tells you something that's unconstitutional, the state can override the federal government when it comes to those matters. Thank you. Thank you very much. Question? I'm going to have to go with that same answer. <laughs> any, any, any time that, and we know from recent years that uh, especially the current presidential administration violating constitution, they have repeatedly. They pindered, they pindered their own law enforcement in taking actions when we all know that there are certain people in Washington, D.C. that should be under investigation and probably should have been in bars a couple of years ago. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to agree with that. The state and we can determine whether or not what they are trying to do to us is constitutional or not. Thank you. Thank you very much. It, that was a tough, that was a tough one. Um, I think that is the end. Uh, they have a two, what's that? Two minute closing, each of you, please. Craig, if you'll start us off. I will. As, as I said earlier, my name's Craig Johnson. I've been in law enforcement full time for about 27 and a half years. Uh, during that little bit of a time, I was uh, a reserve officer for the Grapevine Police Department and the Wise County Sheriff's Office. Prior to my time as Chief Deputy Second in Command of the Sheriff's Office, I was a Justice of the Peace here in Wise County in Precinct 2, northwest part of the county. Before that, I was retired for a brief moment. Before that, I was at the Grapevine Police Department where I went uh, to work in 1994. Uh, there I served as patrol officer, training officer, motorcycle officer. Yes, we wrote a lot of tickets and yes, I still have my boots. The um, major crimes investigator, crimes against persons, SWAT team member, hostage negotiator, had a long list of training and expertise. I have my master's peace officer certification, but when I started my career in early 1993, I started at the Wise County Sheriff's Office. The Wise County Sheriff's Office at the time was under Sheriff Phil Ryan. The Wise County Sheriff's Office was an excellent place to start. My time in the jail was a wonderful experience because you learned how to deal with folks who had done some of the worst of the worst. And you also learned to deal with people who maybe made just a bad mistake that's not reflective of their character. And quite frankly, that was invaluable experience to carry with me because as a two-year deputy leaving here, I had more experience than a five-year officer there. I say that to give you some additional background on myself, but Wise County is not sleepy little Wise County. We do big things here. We're busy. We are incredibly, insanely busy. We have handled, in the last year, we have had the most high-profile crazy cases, and they were handled well. Thank you. Thank you so much. Karen. Okay, so the reason why I'm running for sheriff, uh, I patrol free, at least weekly. I see things that, you know, y'all don't usually see. The retention problem at the SO, the sheriff's office, is really problematic. Really problematic. And, and a lot of people will say, well, it's because of pay. Well, I've interviewed 20, over 20, former and current employees from the Wise County Sheriff's Office. And it is not about the pay. It is not all about the pay. Only one out of those individuals said it was for the pay. So there's a retention problem, and there's a morale problem, and we need to get that fixed. The lack of training, or the lack of joint active shooter training amongst the other police departments is sorely lacking. Rome has two schools within their jurisdiction that the sheriff's office 
controls, but there is no joint training for active shooters for our kids and grandkids. Same thing with the city of Boyd. There is no training. So that needs to be changed. We need professional law enforcement practices. We need, we need citizen involvement. Uh, citizen involvement for me is key. And if you use the city of Bridgeport's chief, uh, Chief Stanford, he is the epitome of a citizen or a, a civilian citizen oriented police department. Chief, Chief Davis from, from Rome, thank God he's there. He is the, the second best chief of Rome. Uh, you know, it is, it is, it's all about getting with the citizens. What happened to the police explorers for the sheriff's office back in 2017? I was in charge of the police explorers in Rome back in the day. I had kids coming from Trophy Club, coming from Newark to be part of the, the explorers group. There's so many things that need to be done. And I can go on and on, and she said stop. So. <laughs> Thank you, Carrie. Thank you all. Wesley? Uh, again, I'm, I'm going to throw this out there. While I was the branch master of Wise County, one of the things that I did every year prior to school starting was do force on force training with SROs. I personally conducted that. I don't know if that continues or not, but I'm gonna tell you that one thing the Sheriff's Office needs right now is leadership. And the true sign of a leader is the success of the people he trained. If you wanna find out about my leadership, ask the Wise County Deputy. There are plenty of them in this room. The, uh, my goal is to, is to literally save the Sheriff's Office. The retention there is terrible, terrible. That's why you have a recruiting, you don't, if you have a recruiting issue, it's because you have an underlying retention issue. And if you can't keep deputies there, and it's not because they're leaving for more money, it's because they're leaving because of bad leadership. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. One of the main reasons I'm running for sheriff is, is to change a little bit. Uh, I think the sheriff's office, got, they have problems right now with uh, keeping personnel, not only deputies, jailers, and dispatchers. Uh, I agree with some of them. That, that it's not all about the money. It is about uh, morale and everything else. Equipment, not just morale, it's equipment and stuff like that. You've got to make your employees feel like they're wanted and appreciated. Uh, and we need uh, changes like that. Right now, they're currently, I'm going to say probably six or seven deputies short. That's six or seven deputies short that's on the patrol side that, that are not answering calls here in this, in this county. So what you're having to do is you're, you're having to wait for people to get there because there's so many calls. Wise County is a busy, busy place. They get lots of calls and everything else. But they only you know, go so many places, but they need, need to get a little bit of change. Uh, one of the things that's one of my big deals is uh, I would like to see uh, more cooperation with the other local law enforcement agencies. Uh, we need to embrace talking to them cooperate with them, fight crime, even consider even doing a joint task force for investigation purposes. You know, ten people's heads are, well, we got six, six different police departments in this county. Six people would be a little bit better than uh, one person, one agency. There's, there's changes. Everybody has different ideas. And so that's one of the big things that I think we can do. And I also like to see this, this agency, the Wise County Sheriff's Office, to become an accredited department like Decatur and Bridgeport, where you get to have some uh, cohesion with the way they work. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. <laughs> Sitting up here is not easy in answering all these questions, so I just want to applaud you guys one more time before you can exit. They will be here for interviews.
Okay, we are on to the next round. Texas House District 64, no, yes, yes. Come on up. You're a three, and you are a two. Okay, Andy, if you'll sit right here. Miss Elaine, if you'll sit right over there in the middle. Right where the mics are. There you go. Okay, you will both start with a minute introduction. We'll do it right this time. And if you will, look at the beautiful lady in red, and she will then give you your marks. Okay, please, Andy. Hey, all. My name is Andy Hopper. Uh, I live here in Wise County. I'm here with my beautiful wife, Amanda, and two of my boys are here. My oldest son is not, but he just got married two weeks ago to a Bridgeport girl. We're very proud of all of our kids. I'm a software engineer. I'm a chief warrant officer in the Texas State Guard. Um, joined a bunch of families here and started Wise County Conservatives a number of years ago. So we are uh, outstandingly conservative folks, and I'm telling you what, there's some real issues in the Texas House. We have to. These guys down there are putting Democrats in charge of committees, voted for the largest spending increase in Texas history, voted for $18 billion in corporate welfare, voted for the impeachment of Ken Paxton with 61 Democrats. And I tell you, there's a fellow that's running for this race that is not here tonight. His stated reason is that it is not a neutral environment. I'm telling you what, last night he had time to spend two hours talking to voters for a congressional district race that he doesn't even live in that district. So I'm telling you what, we need changes, we need people who are willing to stand up to conservatives and hear their questions and talk to them about what they care about, just like here in West County. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Amy. Thanks. Good evening, I'm Elaine Hayes. And first and foremost, I am a person of faith. And I would not be in this race if I did not feel specifically called to it. I want to introduce my husband at the back with me there. Uh, nine years ago, Tracy was the victim of a hit and run accident and was given less than a 20% chance to survive. And I was told that if he did wake up from a coma, he would need care 24 seven the rest of his life. In Thanksgiving, he completed a full Ironman. So I believe God for big things because I have seen him work miracles in my own home. Tracy and I have four children, five grandchildren. They all live in Texas, and I am concerned about their future. I am concerned about the direction that our state has taken. It is certainly not the state that I grew up in, and I believe that I am called to use my skill set to defend their future as well as the future of your families. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, these questions are gonna be a little more lengthy, so bear with me, okay? Wise Republican Party, this will go to you, Andy, to start. In the next regular session, how many bills would you expect to offer, and what will be at the top two topics that you would address? Okay, so if you go through my website, my platform is extensive, I say everything I believe in, why I believe it, and I tell you, I, I actually went through and counted this up. I think I'm up to like 20 bills that I have committed to, to, to filing, which I'm happy to do. But the two, two issues that I care about the most, and I think that have to be addressed, are our election integrity. But by the way, every single bill that was put before the House Committee on Elections got killed in the Elections Committee. They didn't even see the light of day. Can you believe that our Republicans down in Austin are not interested in clearing voter rolls? It's the, it's the lowest hanging fruit that we have. Just clear the voter rolls every census. I fight for elections. The other thing is, is the border. Our border is open, y'all. I'm in the guard and I'm telling you, our border is open. The cartels have operational control over our border. There was a bill called HB 20 that was before the last session that would have created a Texas border force, a permanent force on the border. And that bill made it all the way through the Senate and it died in the House. And what did they spend the last few hours doing? They impeached Ken Paxton and they didn't get this bill passed. So we need comprehensive border security in the state of Texas. So thank, thank you, you Andy. Thank you so much. Yes, to, to repeat the question, in the next regular session, how many bills would you expect to offer? And what would be the top two topics that you would address? 
Well, one of the things that, um, when I think of that question, whether it's authored by myself or not, is not the issue. I think in Austin we need a little bit more of not caring who gets the credit and whether your name is on the top of that bill. And I think it is one of the things that keeps people from standing up against our current speaker because they are afraid of losing committee chairs and opportunities to pass legislation with their name on it. Uh, the two areas that uh, actually, we had good legislation this last year, border security and election security. And so it's not even having to create from the, you know, invent a new wheel, but it's actually to go back and begin working those through our, our, our process. Um, on our border, you do not have a nation. There is no national sovereignty if you have a wide open border. As a border state, Texas is picking up more of the financial expenses on our education, our medical, and our transportation, and we have to secure our border. Thank you very much. Thank you. I am going to ask if everyone does walk out and have private conversations, let's just make sure we're being respectful for those that are on the stage for it. Thank you. Okay, number two, and this will start with you, Ms. Elaine. Southwise Republican Club ask this question. Texas ranks 41 out of 50 in education. Our children are being indoctrinated, sexualized, and failing academically. Instead of educating our schools, are taking a parental rights and teaching beliefs, behaviors, and attitudes. As a candidate, what do you know about legislation that is driving this, and how would you correct it? So to summarize, education is not, it's not the main focus right now. This group believes that our children are taught more beliefs and how to live and, and more on the parental side. How do we redirect that? One of the biggest topics that has been uh, in discussion during this last legislative session and so, ma so many conversations with individuals is about school choice, which is part of this question. But it is really behind that question of what is driving people to be so concerned right now having their kids in the public school system? Why are parents looking for other alternatives and expanding more um, of our homeschool community? And as we look at some of the areas, the things that are the biggest concerns to families I feel are coming from our federal government, that it gets passed down, mandated at the federal level, and then codified at our state level. I think we need to begin the conversation of not only energy independence for the state of Texas, but education independence, where Texas is creating our own laws about education but that is going to mean that we are going to have to fund it. To do that, it means that you are going to have to forego, but we can do that through budgeting, both preparing far enough ahead. Thank you very much. Andy, same question. Let me know if you need me to summarize again. No, I'm, I'm telling you what, there's so much to talk about here, but let me give you one example of what's driving this, and it comes from the Texas State Legislature. Last session, they passed a bill called HB 1605. This is a bill that no educator wants. I've talked to superintendents in Wise County, nobody asked for this. It's a lobbyist bill that basically has languages, open education resources. Go Google that. That comes right from UNESCO's website. It's a bill that basically puts your kids in front of more digital curriculum, but what is important is it takes the rules and the rights statutory authority away from the State Board of Education and puts it in the hands of TEA, an unelected liberal group. And that happened this past session. My opponent co uh, actually voted for that bill, if you can believe that. This is ridiculous, but we have so much more going on at the local level. We have uh, teachers that are not being taken care of in any way, shape, or form. They're leaving the pr profession. They are basically, I, I was told a story the other day, a teacher, these, there's actually situations where these teachers actually have essentially PTSD because they're being terrorized by students because we are not taking care of our teachers and the risk that they are putting. We're expecting them to be under greater risk than we expect uh, police officers and fire department officers. So we need teachers to be protected and we are not protecting them. Thank you. Thank you. The Patriot Society of Boyd asked this question and it will go to you, Andy. Article 4, Section 7 of the Texas Constitution states that the governor, as commander-in-chief of the military forces, 
shall have the power to call forth the militia to execute the laws of the state, to suppress insurrections, and to repel invasions. That's correct. Oops, I'm so sorry. Not done. Oh, I want to talk about that. No. I was like, where's the question? And so we continue. Since the federal government is failing to protect its citizens against invasion and imminent danger, do you feel Texas has the authority to repel the invasion without seeking approval from the federal government? What steps would you take to protect and accomplish this? And I'm done. Okay, so Article 4, Section 7, and that language that says that states have the right to protect themselves actually comes from the Articles of Confederation before that British common law. It is an inalienable right, just like the Second Amendment right. You have a right to protect yourself. You also have a corporate right to protect your state. It cannot be take, transferred, cannot be taken away, cannot be delegated to any entity, including the federal government. That right reframes Texas' ability to control the border as a war powers issue, not an immigration issue. It's an entirely different realm of law. This is the amazing thing about this. Is, uh, Ken Cuccinelli actually talked about this years ago, but there's no case law on this. It's a beautiful thing. If the state of Texas declared an invasion on the border, it no longer has to listen to the federal government. In fact, it could basically achieve operational control over the entire Texas border. And that's what I would say we do. I say we seize the federal um, uh, land that's along the border that is used as conduits and ports of entry for the cartels. And we basically achieve complete control over the entire Texas border. Texas has done it before. For the 188 years that Texas has existed, for most of that time, Texas has secured its own border. Federal Thank government's been worth it for a long time. Thank you, Andy. Yes, I agree. We have the authority to do that. Because there is the question mark in so many people's minds, you know, you hear it all the time, well, the state can't do that, that's up to the federal government. And so we have just stood back waiting and just watching this invasion across our southern border. And my position has been we have watched from the federal government executive orders that overstepped their boundary, and it's like, if there's a question and it's rule overturned later, why don't we try it? Why don't we move forward on it and go ahead and implement those things? There were, there were voices saying we can't put the barriers in the middle of the river. There were voices saying you can't put the wire up. There were voices saying you can't do the busing. And it's like, we'll go ahead and do it. If it works through the court system and then it gets turned overturned, maybe we had two or three years of actually trying to slow down and stop people just walking freely across our border, claiming asylum and then not even giving a notice to appear. And so it mo so many of our resources have been not to repel, but to process. And that has to change. Thank you very much. What, this is from Wise County Conservatives. What is your view of the 10th Amendment to the US Constitution? Does it still have relevance of federal and state government relations? And if so, how? Well, it's really a follow-up of what I was saying before. There's a lot of times question marks between that. States absolutely have every right that hasn't been specifically delineated in the Constitution. And so you go ahead and take those actions instead of, if you think it's a gray area, go ahead and move forward. It is very unique and, and an expectation for us as citizens. We expect our state to protect us, to protect our property, to protect us from the crime, the drugs, the sex trafficking that is coming across our border. And this is just one other area where implementation of the 10th Amendment is what something that voters are asking our state legislatures to do. Thank you very much. Andy? So, here's the thing. The 10th Amendment has been ignored for all of our lifetimes and it's the most important aspect of the federal constitution because, you know, our founders, when they actually debated this in the Constitutional Convention, they actually said there was somebody that actually proposed that the federal government should have the ability to veto state laws, and that was explicitly, explicitly discarded. And here we have a situation where every, every regulatory agency basically has the power of law. The Tenth Amendment is the right of the states to basically say, this is our domain. And not only that, the federal government is not allowed to decide its own jurisdiction. That was actually something that Thomas Jefferson made very clear, is that the federal government doesn't get to decide what its own jurisdiction is. It's up to the states. 
Federalist 26 says the state should be always suspicious and jealous guardians of the rights of the citizens against the encroachments of the federal government, that they are to be the arm and the voice of the people. In fact, the most powerful branch of government, according to our founders, is your state legislature, and they should be the guardians of making sure that the jurisdiction of the federal government is the few and enumerated powers of the, of the, the Constitution allows, not this expansive everything that we see today. Thank you very much. question that wasn't so hard <laughs> we are going to give both of you two minutes apiece if you will again beautiful lady in red she'll kind of give you your cues and then y'all can leave andy i think you were first right so we have to go on a line come on up. Yeah. <laughs> well hey we're in a pickle here as a state um, we all know this we've talked about some of the issues that are profound that face us and here's the deal we have a state legislature that basically is made up of two parts. The Senate passes conservative legislation, the House kills conservative legislation in general. There's a few good things that came through, but we had four special sessions, and if you actually count it up, these guys only spent 39 hours gaveled in. And four special sessions, that's a month each. It's absolutely amazing, it cost a million dollars for each one of those special sessions. And the thing that's encouraging, though, in the midst of everything that we've seen, everything we've talked about, is the fact that we have 51 districts where incumbents are being primaried by conservative challengers. Just on the law of averages, we have a chance to actually fix the Texas House. Just like in Washington, just like in Washington, we have 20 that are willing to stand up and make you know, concrete, positive changes. In the Texas House, because we only have 150 members, the magic number is 10. 10 members can basically write a petition and basically overrule the speaker's vote to basically kill a vote and get some transparency, that will change the Texas House. But right now we only have five guys that are willing to stand up. We saw that 61 de Democrats and 60 Republicans joined to impeach Ken Paxton. And because of that, we have a groundswell of people that are willing to take back their Texas House. So we have an opportunity in this race. I ran for this two years ago. It was the closest race in the state. It was 88 votes out of 20,000. And you might think that Wise County was, didn't swing the bat for the district. We had eight more voters in Wise County than the Denton side of the district. And this time, we are projected to have between 500 and 1,000 more voters in Wise than Denton County. So this is a district that we can win. We need to win it. I need your help. Hopperfortexas.com. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I wanted to thank everybody for being here tonight and all the organizations that helped organize and put this together. It's really important. Um, you know, it is... I lost my train of thought for a second. Oh, here it is. Uh, it, we all want legislators to, to stop bad legislation and pass good legislation when we send them down to Austin. But that is not going to be enough because that does not change hearts and that is not going to change our culture. It is going to take all of us being on our knees and remembering the core foundation of this country. What made America unique was the fact that we were self-governing individuals, no king, no state-run religion, but it was run from individuals who believed in a sovereign God and respected the sovereignty of the word. Our laws were all created from Christian, Judeo-Christian beliefs. And the experiment with that was if individuals with those types of beliefs ran the government, that it would create a better, freer, more prosperous, safer culture for everybody. People of all faith or people of no faith. We see in our country today what has happened when we remove that. The protections that were there for everybody have been removed. Texas is a firewall to the state, to the country. But we have lost our identity, and it is time for us to remember that we are a beacon and a leader of freedom and independence. The Tarrant County area is the last district, the urban area in the country, to vote red. Wise County is a backstop to that. It is crucial for us to stand up to strengthen and fortify our state. Thank you. Thank you.
again, thank you guys so much for being here. We are going, to, and I'll let you guys exit. Um, they are going to be here for some interviews, conversation, maybe coffee, if not water. Um, definitely sweet treats by our sponsor. And thank you guys very much for being here. We are going to take a little break. Guys, these people are running. They want your vote, but they also need your support. So if there's a way you want and you liked what you heard tonight, please go and support them. And that means financially too, because it doesn't, it's, it costs money. So if you can, go support those. And we'll be back at Monica. What time are we going to be back? Seven to ten minutes. Seven to ten minutes. Enough to, to go get a treat and a bathroom break. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to ask everyone to take a seat if you are going to do that or take your conversation outside. Make sure everyone can hear me. Marco. Marco. All right. Okay, as we get seated. Yes. We've got one more coming, but I'm going to ask the gentleman to make a quick announcement, if we can, before we get started, please. All right, good evening. My name is Rick Lifto. I'm going to be the new county chair for Wise County, uh, the Republican Party for Wise County, after June 13th. Mike Drury was not able to come this evening. Um, he had an illness in the family, and his daughter is very sick. So uh, I would ask you to please have your uh, prayers for Mike and his family, because it is a serious situation. His daughter is very young. So um, what I want to mention two things. We are getting a lot of inquiries about the candidates and everything from the sheriffs, all the disputed ones. Who are these people? Who are the House candidates? What do they stand for? Especially about the congressional candidates. So what we've done now is we are going to set up on the Wise County Republican Party website a button that says Meet the Candidates. On there, it's going to go to another button, and it'll say congressional candidates. It's going to have all the congressional candidates listed, one through, I believe it's 11, but I'm not sure. And then it's going to have the House candidates, uh, the Senate candidate, which is only one. Uh, well, I'll get two because I think he's got a uh, Democratic opponent. And then it'll go down to the sheriff's candidates and so forth. So when you push the button, it's going to go to their link. We're offering to them, because we've got to hire a technical guy to help us with this thing, um, to put in videos and a link to their particular candidacy so you can learn about these people and um, we are not publicly going to endorse anybody um, but we are going to try to op uh, offer as many opportunities as we can for everybody in the county to get to know them. I know this is being live FaceTime. There are a lot of people watching this. This is going to be sent out to multiple places and multiple websites. So I want everybody to know if you want to know who these candidates are within the next seven days we hope to have this set up. So you can go to the Wise County Republican Party website, push the button about meet the candidate, and then you're going to be able to push it and get to that individual and find out who all of them are, and they'll have their own videos and links as to when they want to participate in this program. And uh, with that, um, welcome, and thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay, last but not least. All right. Make sure I have the right one. Okay, so everyone grabbed the ducky and you did so well. Can we give them a round of applause for the ducky? <laughs> We're going to start with you, if you would please. I think the names are about to come up there. Nope, that's, well, that's me. So we're going to keep going to the next slide and then we will introduce the first candidate, which. <laughs> oh, you have to arrange it, right? Yes. Joel, if you will, please, thank you. And you have one minute. If you will look at the beautiful Miss Deb, just found out her name, no more red shirt, Miss Deb, and then she'll kind of cue you. Hello, my name is Joel Krauss. I have lived in the district for more than 30 years. I've owned a small business in the district for 30 years. I've had a business in China for 10 years. I have visited more than 55 countries and studied their history. Those two things are very, very important to understand what's going on in the world. Okay. As a Republican, I started early. Uh, I worked for the Bob Dole campaign. In college, I was the I was candidate for city council. I ran for 2014, 2016, this office. Uh, I've worked for the, uh, Trump in Iowa. I worked for Josh Hawley in Missouri. I was on the SD12 Resolutions Committee 
and most recently of the Vice President of the Texas Republican Assembly. I believe in truth, accountability, and responsibility to reunite this country. Wonderful, thank you. Okay, our second Bert, if you will, sir. You have one minute and just check out the step. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, can you all hear me back there? Awesome. Uh, my name is Bert Thacker, uh, and I'm sure you all will learn a bit about me tonight, but uh, I just wanted to thank you, Madam Mayor. I wanted to thank you, Mrs. Hopper. I wanted to thank you, precinct chairs. And, uh, this gentleman over here, Rick Lifta, once told me how he's, uh, he's working to help people who have green cards learn about the United States. It's one of the reasons why the Democratic Party is beating us hand over fist. Uh, I met a young woman in this town who's 22 years old. Her son, Connor, is two years old. They don't have health care. I met a young lady down the street who is scared about the future of her country. People in community colleges here who don't know if they'll have a job. Farmers who have committed suicide because they can't afford to pay their loans. And the encroachment of China on the United States, the encroachment of the federal government on the United States, and I intend to put a stop to it. And I hope you'll listen to me tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hi, everybody. My name is Jason Ferguson. Um, you can just call me Jason because I'm the only Jason on the ballot. Just for Jason. Uh, I am a technologist. Uh, I am a community builder. Um, I've, um, I uh, originally uh, created communities in the temp area, basically to help people to learn technology. Uh, I worked for a church for over five years, and in that, created a community of uh, church IT people that grew to be one of the largest church organizations in the country, uh, something I'm very proud of. So I very much believe in the power of we the people. Um, I'm in this fight because I'm like you. Uh, when you talk about you want people to step up and to be citizen candidates, I'm that guy. I don't belong at this stage, except that this is our seat, this is our house, this is our country. And uh, I can no longer stand back and let them push and push and push. The way you stop a bully is you stand up to a bully. So my view of this is uh, Trump started something for us where he showed us we can push back, and we saw the ugly face of, of the way the government attacks us. We need to stand our ground. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm going to guess Dr. Nina here. <laughs> Hi, good evening everybody. I'm Dr. Nina Biswas, and um, I am a uh, physician with uh, three medical specialties in uh, internal medicine, geriatrics, hospice, and palliative care. I've spent about 10 years actually working in rural and underserved areas, serving the veterans of America, and also serving in underserved areas in, in Texas. Um, I also run a technology company, which is a global firm, and I uh, have been on uh, a local school board and served my community. I would like to be the voice of reason um, in Congress for all the issues and challenges that we are facing in the state of Texas and hold our uh, federal government accountable to do their job. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can you all hear me? Yeah, my name is Doug Robeson. I am a recently retired judge. You have to do a resign to run rule. I was four times a district judge in Denton County. I lived in Denton County for 37 years. I had an 80 acre farm for many of those years. Used to take my cattle right up here to the Decatur Livestock Option on 51 um, all the time. So I know a little bit about Wise County, and I do like sweetie pies, ribeyes. Um, so, but and Wise County is important, and that's why we are here tonight. Um, any candidate who is not here is making a big mistake. I will also tell you that uh, I'm here. I'll ask the obvious question. Look at this guy with gray hair. Why is he running today? You know why I'm running today? Because I care about my kids. I care about my grandkids. And I want a future for this America, and to have a future for this America, we need it to be America. The rule of law says, if you come here illegally, you are to be deported. Congress has abandoned that. The federal government has abandoned that, and we need to enforce it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Brandon? 
Hey, how are y'all? Thanks for having me out here. My name is Brandon Gill. I'm a constitutional conservative, and I'm proud to say on the first day of my campaign, I endorsed Donald Trump for president. I'm honored to say that Donald Trump has also endorsed me to run for U.S. Congress. I've also been endorsed, thank you, I've also been endorsed by the House Freedom Fund, which is the political arm of the Freedom Caucus, and I'm the only person here who can tell you that I will be a member of the Freedom Caucus on day one. I'll tell you a little bit about myself, though. I grew up about 150 miles west of here on a cattle ranch in a little town called Eula. I grew up with about 300 head of cows, four dogs, and a donkey that we called Barack. <laughs> we, uh, like most people from a small town, I grew up on a, a steady diet of Angus beef and Rush Limbaugh. I'm running because I've been on the front lines of conservative media for the past several years. I started an online news, news outlet called a, a DC Inquirer. It's pro-Trump, it's America first. I've been producing movies, including Police State, and worked on one called 2000 Meals, and now I'm ready to fight in Washington. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Hi everybody, I'm Vladimir the Franceschi, or just Vlad. Uh, you can tell by the name, I'm not originally from Texas. In fact, I'm a two-time refugee from communism, or escapee. Uh, one time from a Cold War Eastern European country where I got my name, and a second time from California in 2020. <laughs> uh, and I've been here since. And I've lived in a police state. Uh, I can literally show you my ID card with a little hammer and sickle on it. We were surveilled on, we were, phone calls were wiretapped, Christians were persecuted. The law was weaponized. Uh, well, you know how it, you, you'll see how it, uh, next weekend what it looks like. And the point being is that I spent a lot of time since 2020 volunteering with CDF, with the Texas Street Project, being a citizen activist, doing what I can, going to the hotel symposium, and feel that the, the way I can be of most help to you is to take my knowledge, my experience. And the fact that I'm a Stanford trained lawyer and I've been writing contracts and reading laws for almost 20 years to represent you in Congress. Thank you so much. Scott? My name is Scott Army. I'm running for Congress because I love this country, I love this state, and I love this district. But most importantly, I'm running for Congress because I love my children. In 1984, at the age of 15, I walked door to door in this very district to turn it red for the very first time. In 1992, at the age of 22, I was elected then county commissioner and served as county commissioner and, and county judge for about 10 years. After that, I served under President Bush at the General Services Administration, where part of my job was to build uh, border stations and equip our border patrol agents. I know what it takes to protect our borders because that was my job. In 2017, January 20th, 2017, when President Trump took office, Congress had been in office for about three weeks, Republican House, Republican Senate. That was enough time for them to have a dozen bills on his desk ready to take action, ready to turn into law, and they did nothing. Well, I remember when we had a Congress that actually took action. On January 20th, 2025, we'll have a Republican House, we'll have a Republican Senate, and I want to have a dozen bills on President Trump's desk day one when he starts his second term to turn into law. Thank you. Thank you. John? Good evening, everyone. My name is John Huffman. I am the husband to the amazing homeschool mom, Elizabeth, right here in the front row. Honey, thank you for being here. I'm the father to three incredible kids whose future in a strong and prosperous America is worth fighting for, which is why we're all here tonight. And I am the mayor of South Lake, where we have achieved for almost 10 years conservative victories that we wish we were seeing in Washington, D.C., like balanced budgets and real tax cuts. For five years, we've delivered property tax cuts to our residents, putting more money back in their pockets, and maybe most famously, fighting against the evil ideologies of cultural Marxism and CRT and DEI and pushing those ideologies out of our schools. And I'm running for Congress because these are not normal times, because the insanity of the federal government is very literally threatening our way of life. We have a border that's broken, and it's been broken intentionally by Biden and Mayorkas because they are trying to destabilize our way of life. 
We have an inflation that's out of control because Congress and the White House won't stop spending money, and we have a weaponized federal bureaucracy that is doing everything it can to make you poor, to make you dependent, and to put you under its thumb. And I'm running for Congress to fight back on all this, and I look forward to your vote on March 5th. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, this will go to Joel. You'll be first. So as you all saw before, or maybe you were interviewing, it'll start with Joel, and you will all receive the same question in one minute, and it will go down the line. The second question will start with you, the third, and so on. Okay? All right, the first question is from Wise Republican Party. Earmarks, often referred to as pork, are typically slipped into large spending bills without debate or input from relevant federal agencies and often appear in legislation just hours before Congress votes on appropriation bills. Do you support earmarks? And if not, how do you plan to end that practice? Okay, that's all to do with accountability and truth, okay? Like we've been talking about truth, accountability, and responsibility, okay? Earmarks, first of all, we need to hold our congressmen accountable. Every congressman should be not be making any more money than his salary, okay? No more than his salary. Everybody here should take an oath. I will not more make more any money than my salary, okay? So those earmarks may go away if they're not making more money than their salary. Because what is the, the motivation to do such things? Every spending bill should have a super majority to get passed, okay? And the earmarks should almost be outlawed. We need to stop the spending, and we need to bring America together through truth, accountability, and responsibility. We need a different news agency. We need it. The oath of office does not mean anything anymore. When there's a problem, I'm going to tell you what the problem is in doing the last Okay? <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay, Bert, same question. And, and by the way, if anyone needs me to repeat it, I'm happy to do so. Thank you, ma'am. Um, hey, everyone. I, I work in construction. I'm a project manager. I have a blue-collar job. My wife says uh, I have chicken feet. I respectfully disagree. I have very manly feet that have been shaped by wearing steel-toed boots. And I can tell you, after looking at budgets, there's something we all need to understand. You know what the difference between a million, a billion, and a trillion is? A million seconds is about 11 days. A billion seconds is about 32 years. A trillion seconds, 32,000 years. Right now, we're at $34 trillion, and the interest on the debt alone is gonna be $1.7 trillion a year. Guess what, the Democratic Party is playing nonstop with earmarks. I'll give you a quick example as to why we need to start playing the same game. $34 million was sent to Pakistan for gender studies. You know what $34 million, yes, it's true. You know what that would have done here? When you have Chief Campbell, and I meet him, and he tells me that you need to hire eight officers here, and they don't have the budget because it's only $4 million, guess what? We haven't even reached $28 million out of that. So if we are gonna spend earmarks left and right, we might as well be doing it to build up our districts, build up our schools, build up our police. Thank you very but much. do it right. Jason. Earmarks have been around a long time. They have always been an issue from the beginning. That's why they snuck it in uh, to where it wasn't something that we voted on. But that being said, that's not the fight we need to fight. That, we need to fight that and then some. Right now, the biggest fight we have is that our freedoms are being taken away piece by piece, and you're seeing it in real time changing happening now. If we do not stand up to uh, protect our freedom of speech, the election integrity, and then the votes coming across the border, our voices don't matter. Look at California. Um, my wife's family is from California, and all we hear is that their voice doesn't matter. They can they can impeach the sitting governor. He still survives. So the ask the, the concept that we're 34 um, 34 trillion dollars uh, over is was well, an issue for Obama. But Biden, you hardly ever hear about it. Why is that? Because it's not in our interest? Of course it is. But the problem is, is that they're trying to hide the things that are the most important to us. We need to get our voices out. We need a strong person to defend uh, to, to defend our rights. Specifically, if there are earmarks related to our freedoms, I will not let it pass. If that means shutting the government down, that is the line I'll stand. We'll see where the Democrats want to play chicken. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Nina, same question. 
Yes, but just for the audience, I'd like you to repeat the question. Happy to. Earmarks are often referred to as pork, are typically slipped into large spending bills without debate or input from the relevant federal agencies and often appear in legislation just hours before Congress votes on the appropriations bills. Do you support earmarks? And if not, how do you plan to end the practice? Okay, so let me tell you my uh, real experience in life. So um, I was a publicly elected official, school board trustee, and I worked with the budgets and the taxes for the city that I'm in. And uh, basically what I found out is that sometimes the numbers that they present to you, the math does not add up. It is almost like saying, I don't have money in the bank, but I'm going to make this purchase. So how do you take money from where there is no money, unless it is a loan or you borrowed it, or you've changed the numbers, right? So one of the things I have noticed is, is all these things that get slipped in, and one of the very weird things that I have noticed is some of these bills will pass in the midnight hours when everyone is sleeping or no one has an idea what was in that document. I believe this needs to have transparency and very strong governance on what exactly goes into the bill. And we need to have some kind of variability from the original bill to see why these your marks were put in in the first place. Thank you very much. Doug? The simple answer is I'm absolutely against earmarks of any sort, any nature. We have a $32 billion budget deficit in this country. If we ran our households like this, we would all be bankrupt today. And as I said at the outset, I don't want to leave a bankrupt country to my grandchildren or my children. So the earmarks need to go. And no one's mentioned it yet, but the biggest earmark, earmark I've seen is the $400 billion, and I'm probably understating that, Green New Deal. Yeah. They subsidize, they're subsidizing the electric industry and certain industries in that, such as the large auto manufacturers and their electric cars, at the expense of the natural gas industry here in Texas. That is something the founders explicitly said the federal government should not do. We should not be in the business of supporting one business at the expense of another business. And we're supposed to be neutral. Let the marketplace decide. And that's where I stand on that, let the marketplace decide on how you stop that, zero line budgeting. What was in the original contract with America, every line has to be justified. Thank you. The first thing I'll say about earmarks is that they paved the way for government corruption. But I think that it's important to understand why we have earmarks to begin with, and it's because we have a government in Washington that governs via omnibus bill. That's where congressional leadership on the Republican side cozies up to congressional leadership on the Democrat side, and they go to a back room at late at night usually, and somebody writes a 2,000 page bill that nobody's read, and then they decide that they're, they're going to fill it with all kinds of different things for all different congressmen across, across the political spectrum um, that gets them on board to vote for this bill. Nobody's read it. Nobody knows. They just know what they're going to get out of it. That is a disgrace. I think omni government via omnibus is a disgrace, and that needs to end. We do need to end earmarks. But second, we also need to go back to individual appropriations bills because that's what's going to allow Congress to, on a granular level, dissect where our taxpayer money is going so that we can stop sending it to DEI programs, stop paying for abortions, um, and stop sending it to all other kinds of local nonsense. And the last thing I'll say is I'm going to be a hard no vote for any vote to increase the debt ceiling. Thank you. Yeah. I agree with everything everybody else said. I'll tell you something about, I'm so absolutely against earmarks. Here's the problem, I mean, it also takes us Americans to reject them. The problem is that a lot of constituencies hate Congress, but they love the congressmen. They love their local spending, the local poor. It's corruption, it's thievery, it shouldn't be done. You got it. And then as far as these 2,000 page laws dropped in the last minute, just so everybody knows, in law, I write contracts for a living. If you did that, and you gave somebody a 2,000 page contract and said sign it, You've got till tomorrow morning. That is not an enforceable contract. You've got to give the other side the time that they need, the reasonable time, to figure out what the heck it says in there. So I would be, I mean, as a single member of Congress, what can you do? But 
a simple idea if anybody would want to join Mark, join up to it is to say if literally give me you know, so again as a lawyer, if you're gonna drop let's say hundred pages on me to read, how long does it take us to read hundred pages, let alone hundred pages of like have a medicine bottle small print days. So I would come up with a formula that says you've got to give me a certain number of days minimum for a number of pages and the lawyer trying to get me to adopt. Thank you, Brian. Scott? As county commissioner, I cut my own office and my own staff first. As county judge, I cut my own office budget and my own staff first. At GSA, I cut my own office budget and my own staff first. I know a congressman who never once brought pork back to his district, and you know what? His district loved him for it. No earmarks, ban earmarks, bring back line item veto. I don't care which president has it. If they can cut things out of the budget, let's cut things out of the budget. Uh, institute a civilian hiring freeze in the federal government. Uh, implement at least a 1% for five year, every year for five year budget cut for every agency. I worked in GSA, I know that every single agency can find 1% of their budget to cut. And no new spending on anything until action is taken on the border. The new speaker has taken that hard line uh, on funding for Ukraine. Now we need to extend it to any discretionary spending, any new spending. Nothing gets done until they take action on the border. Thank you, Jim. Thank Thanks. Yeah, so there's a lot of talk about cutting the budget. We need to take the budget and burn it to the ground. This is the biggest mess, and again, I'll remind everyone, this is intentional. No one in Washington, D.C. is surprised that the economy is ruined by $34 trillion in debt that my kids and your kids and your grandkids cannot repay. No one's surprised that $2 trillion deficits are leading to record inflation. This is all intentional. So let's start slashing and burning through the budget. Let's get rid of the Department of Education. What an absolutely useless organization. When, 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 when my graduation rates and, and test scores have never been worse. How about let's get rid of the Green New Steel, where they keep giving money to foreign entities and the payoffs for their buddies. I, I mean, what was the what was the, the worst one I saw with the electric vehicle chargers? Five billion dollars for electric vehicle chargers. You'll see that one. You know how many how many chargers they put up for five billion dollars? One charger. Heck, I would have done it for $3 billion and saved them a bunch of money. It would have been a great deal. We've got to slash and burn this way through the federal budget or else none of this is going to get any better. I've balanced the budget every single year in South Lake, and I'm going to do it in Congress. Thank you, John. We were looking for a missing microphone. There was another one on stage. Wow. We're not going to hold that against you, Brandon. <laughs> I like the sharing. That just sharing is caring. Okay, guys, uh, this would be for the second question. Don't you say it, Bert? This is going to be you who's going to start this off. Southwise Republican Chair. This is the question from that group. Clearly define your stance on diversity, equity, and inclusion, especially. Okay. There's more, especially regarding transgender issues and the LGBTQ influence in our schools. Specifically, how will you address the inclusion of trans athletes in sports, threatening and often dangerous situation it creates for young girls and young women? Diversity, equity, inclusion is racism. End of story. Come on. I can't believe I have to say this, that the most powerful women in the world are actually men who are dressed as women. We have reached a level of insanity in our country that it makes absolutely zero sense. Okay, but let's just talk about it from a federal scale. You have women-owned small businesses that get federal set-asides. I mean, I'm sure you know about this, Scott, from the GSA schedule. Now you're going to have men who are basically going to identify as women to get said businesses. What about college uh, uh, scholarships and now you're you're literally putting women in a dangerous place with men coming inside their changing rooms their dressing rooms etc etc look i i come from a family of very powerful women my mom is the strongest person i know my wife is the smartest person i know i don't think we should live in a world where women have to compete against men let's just I mean, <laughs> 
Th th this is just crazy talk. Well, what was the third part of the question? Uh, I, that's all your time, unfortunately, but I think uh, you, I think uh, you uh, did it. Uh, <laughs> let me just be crystal clear on this. We need to have an injection of common sense. Men are men, women are women. Come on. Everybody here knows there is no end to this insanity. Once they have a mindset or a belief system in place, reality has to adapt to it. The moment we allow that is we give the whole playing field over. So we, um, when it comes to women with bathrooms, uh, women in sports, uh, our children, when it comes to um, them wanting to encourage sex changes in our children before they're actually able to even smoke or vote or whatnot, it's absolute insanity. What I say is a zero tolerance on all of it. Um, that includes the departments that uh, require you to, to say the, the appropriate gender and this, that, and the other. Let's just apply common sense to it. Regarding specifically with schools, uh, I look to uh, work with fellow Republicans to, to create uh, to create a law to protect, uh, to one, protect um, women's rights, which that should have been something that was not controversial, and also to be able to protect uh, children, and more importantly, protect parents' rights to be able to raise their children as they see fit. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dr. Nina? So, being a woman, I would ask for extra 30 seconds if possible. <laughs> so, uh, so, I will tell you my, my version of this. First of all, I think diversity in a country like America is a great thing. But, always we have to remember, it, it only goes with merit. It does not go because you have a certain color of a skin, or a certain race, certain religion. We start with merit, and then we talk about diversity. And then we talk about equality, because equality means you treat everybody the same. You don't get a seat at the table just because of, again, some special criteria that you put in. So the word is equality, but it has been transformed into equity for some reason. And of course, everybody wants to feel included, which is inclusivity, right? So those are very good ideas. On the transgender thing, I would say that basically um, there needs to be a drastic education on women's anatomy. Somehow people forgot that there is a uterus where the baby is born and the baby is coming out of. There is something called a period and there is something called breastfeeding, which you cannot replace whether you have implants or a wig or high heels. Thank you, Dr. Nina. <laughs> okay, Doug. This is another reason that I left the bench to run for Congress. Most people don't know that as a judge, you are prohibited from commenting on certain social policy issues. You can't talk. For the first time in 15 years, I can state my opinion on this transgender issue. It's wrong and it needs to be stopped immediately and now. Republicans, and I say this, and it's a statement I've said many years, as Republicans are the party of fact, we are the party of logic, we are the party of historical reality, Democrats are the party of fiction, make-believe, and falsehood. And the fact that there is no more than two sexes is just wrong, it's false, and it, I agree with that statement, zero tolerance for any change in the law on that point because it just defies common sense. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brandon? First thing I'll say is that diversity, equity, and inclusion, just like the Black Lives Matter movement, is predicated on a lie, which is that America is systematically racist. That we cannot tolerate this lie. The second thing I'll say is that there actually is a form of systematic racism in America, and it's racism against white people, and that is what diversity, equity, and inclusion is. It's saying that we're not gonna look at your test scores, for example, if you're applying for college, we're gonna look at the color of your skin. If you're applying for a job, we're gonna look at your racial background, not your, your expected performance on the job, and that has to end. It is flagrantly racist. Um, when it comes to the transgender movement, I think we do have to be pretty blunt and pretty clear about this. If you're a man who wants to put on a dress and go into a girl's bathroom, you're a pervert and you should have no way in the civil society. Thank you. Uh, Sorry, it's been a while. Can you repeat the question? 
That's you. <laughs> Clearly define your stance on diversity, equity, and inclusion, especially regarding transgender issues and the LGBTQ influence in our schools. Specifically, how would you address the inclusion of trans athletes in sports, threatening and often dangerous situation it creates for young girls and young women? But as before, I agree with everything everybody has already said. It's perversion. Um, absolutely against it. I'm for equality opportunity, not equality of outcome. The other part important thing to think about is that this is not a role for the federal government. A lot of this stuff is, the federal government has any business in the Constitution. Rest this in the states. It is a state right to deal with health and safety. So, as a member of Congress, I would make sure to make room for Texas to deal with this the way it wants to deal, to have the policies that Texans want, not policies that some universities or uh, advocates in D.C. want. But as far as transgender goes, think about it. You can't have transgender if there are genders. There are only two, right? Their whole argument falls apart. If, if, to tell me that, it's like saying, you know, how do you explain what's daytime if there isn't night, right? There are two genders, period. Um, now, the, like, for, again, I'm just trying to think about it. The reality is that we are, I look myself as someone auditioning and pitching for a job to represent you. So, you know, I've stated my opinions and where I stand on stuff, but as much as my job is going to be to convey what you have to say to DC. Thank you very much, Scott. John. Oh, I'm sorry. That's, yeah, yeah. Scott, come on up. You're on. You're on. <laughs> Did I? <laughs> the left likes to categorize and label everybody and put them in different categories and then put them in a hierarchy. So, they love that so much that they're now creating new things, new categories. The last I looked, I did some research on this, there's almost as many genders as there are elements in the periodic table. It's like 108 now. And I'm like, oh my gosh. Gender is assigned at birth by God. Boys and girls. If you've ever seen Kindergarten Cop, you know the difference. And you know how he distinguishes between the two. Uh, we must uphold that. If adults, as someone mentioned, want to dress it up as the other sex and uh, live a life that way, you know what? They're free to do that. But when you start mutilating our children because the parent wants attention, that's wrong and that must be stopped at all levels of government. And we must uphold that. We must protect our children. I have a daughter who played soccer and it was rough enough when it was just girls. If there was a boy on the field, she wouldn't have been. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Scott. John? So, so let's be really clear about what DEI is trying to teach our children. That what matters most is not the contents of their character, but the color of their skin. Isn't that what we've been fighting 50 years and 60 years against? It's insane. We fought this fight in South Lake. All of you read about it. In 2020, the radical leftists on the school board and in the, the bureaucrats of the administration put forth what was at the time one of the most far-reaching DEI plans and tried to pass it during the middle of COVID when everyone was on Zoom. I was the first elected official in South Lake to speak up against it, and we rose up as parents, and we fought it, and we beat it, we turned the entire school board and we fired the bureaucrats. I'm going to do the same thing in Washington, D.C., and rip it out. Root and branch, and I'll tell you why the trans issue is so destructive and why I care. Because I've got two daughters, 17 and 13 years old. They are very competitive basketball players, and they deserve a chance to compete fairly against other women. They deserve a shot at scholarships, they deserve a shot at championships, and they deserve to do it without interference from confused boys. So we're going to fight this in DC. We've got to get rid of it once and for all. Okay, uh, okay, the problem I see uh, what's happened over the last several years, okay, is people have been putting themselves ahead of God, values, and our country. And that's why, why we are here today and with all the problems that we have. Now, a couple of stories related to this. My daughter came home, she was in like software, she says she comes home and she knows it's not, not a secret, I'm a conservative at home. And she said to me, she said, 
you know, there's a gay parade in Dallas. We're going, do you want to go? And I said, well, no. Then she said to me, why are all Republicans hate gays? I said, that's not a true statement. Where'd you hear that from? You know, that's, that's not true at all. People have the right to live their life they want. But I'm not going to join the parade, dear. You know, when, when people start kneeling, Okay, I have a close friend that I've known since I was five years old. We go to the we go to ball games, you know, and stuff like that. When they start kneeling, I quit going to the game because I couldn't stand to watch the NFL, and that tore a, a, tore a hole in my relationship with somebody that I was known since I was five years old. That 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 relationship still has not healed. When I have a small business. In every application I have, we are an equal opportunity employer. Thank you, John. People that disrespect our flag, country, or anthem need not apply. Oh. Thank you, John. Okay, uh, third C is Jason. You will have this. He had the last one. Oh, sorry. Right? Yeah. Keeping me on my toes. I see you, Jason. Okay, Jason, this question is for you, and then again, it'll move uh, downward. So, this is a long one. Hang in there with me, okay? <laughs> Article 1, so, sorry, this is the Patriot Society of Boyd. Article 1, Section 10, Clause 3 of the U.S. Constitution states that no state shall, with it, without the consent of Congress, lay any duty of tonnage, keep troops or ships of war in time of peace, enter into an agreement or compact with another state, or with a foreign power, or engage in war, unless invaded, or in such intimate danger, will not emit delay. That's why. Article 4, Section 4 of the U.S. Constitution states, the United States shall guarantee to every state in this union a Republican form of government and shall protect each of them against invasion. And on the application of the legislator or of the executive against domestic violence. The question, based on these two articles, do you feel the federal government is doing everything possible to protect the citizens of the United States from imminent danger due to this invasion? Or do you feel like they are facilitating or do you feel like they are facilitating the invasion? I forgot the question. I know, I know. Do you feel like the government's doing what they say so, they're gonna do? No. Uh, one of the things that people that know me, they know that I don't tolerate long things. I like like the ex express version, so I'll study things at double speed. So the express sanction of this is, of course, the federal government is not protecting us. Everyone here knows that. The problem here is not a matter of whether they can, it's a matter of whether they will. It's a matter of wills. The federal government's not interested in protecting us, it's interested in consolidating power. That is why I'm here, that's why I'm standing here today. I'm not a politician, but I can no longer tolerate the federal government stepping over and taking over our freedoms, our rights. They are intentionally opening the board, everyone knows it, on every side, to, get, to garner votes for themselves. Now here's the thing I, I love. Um, part of my family is um, has Mexican heritage, and I can tell you that those that come over here from Mexico, they come here and immediately are like, "Well, we don't want the borders open. We don't want free money. We're hard workers. We want we want the American dream." So, regardless of that coming over, the point is that they're family oriented. They're about values. They're about hard work. They're they're a prototypical kind of an American. How long do you think they're going to stay Democrat? How long do you think they're going to go with progressives that they, they try to force their children to change genders? All this is a moot point because eventually it's going to come around to our values are what keep us together, and that's what's going to make us strong. Thank you, Thank you Jason. <laughs> Dr. Nina, to recap, do you feel that both these articles on war and domestic violence do you feel that the federal government is doing everything possible to protect the citizens of the United States from danger or invasion? So, uh, just like you cannot have warships at a time of peace, uh, similarly, we should not be having crime at a time of peace. So, my question is, if we are having so many issues in this country where there is crime and 
we, we cannot solve them. Are we at peace right now? Or are we similar to some of the other nations that we are going and supporting? So why is our state not stepping in, taking action, backing the blue, and saying, well, let's do our job, keep our streets safe, just like we keep our borders safe, but we also have to take part in that. We can't allow just another, another voice to come in and say, hey, you need to do this, and because we think this is good for you, or they have done this in another state. Maybe those standards are not the standards we need for Texas. And I think that's where we start. We cannot overlook crime. We have to back our police. We have to back laws in this country. That's what America was built on. That's right. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, Doug? As stated at the beginning here, the short answer is the federal government's not doing anything, and all of us in this room know it. The question is, what do we do about it? And I will say this, Governor Abbott finally did pass a law, as I understand it, that said DPS is fully authorized to arrest somebody who's here illegally and deport them to the border. The federal government yesterday sued the state government. First solution, get Bulldog Penn Paxson to hire the best lawyers, constitutional lawyers you can in this country and defend that law so that we can, in fact, exercise that right ourselves. The, uh, Another thing, I was a judge in the uh, family law court in Denton County, and I handled over 575 CPS cases. A lot of them involve drugs, and the drug of choice today is fentanyl, which is coming in from Mexico. And it is a, it is a founding principle in our country that family law matters are reserved to the states, and we have the ability to protect our children from fentanyl by enforcing the border, because that is a imminent danger to this state and our children. Thank you. Thank you. Brandon? The federal government has ceded territory on our southern border to some of the most violent and evil drug cartels in the entire world. And I think that the reason that the left is doing this, and it is the Biden administration, with my work as under him, absolutely facilitating this facilitating not only the, the border invasion, but one of the largest human trafficking operations in the world right now. The reason they're doing it is twofold. One, it's so that they can sow the seeds of chaos and destruction in this country that creates a fertile environment for socialism and big government to thrive. Number two, they're doing it so that they can flood our country with voters who they believe will vote reliably Democrat forever. And they know that they can't win elections, so they, they rig them in this way. So the, the question is, what do we do about it? And I think there are a few things. One, we have to return to President Trump's border policies, and I will be fighting right alongside President Trump every step of the way. We do have to build the wall. We have to reform our asylum laws. We have to bring back Remain in Mexico. But last and most importantly, we have to deport every single one of the illegal aliens that Joe Biden has brought into our country, even if that means every single one of them. Thank you, Brandon. Vlad? All right, I love saying it. I agree with everyone. Um, trying to think. So, I'm a legal, legal immigrant. How do you think I feel watching millions cut line? Very, very beat up. I've got friends waiting in line to get student visas. Who knows what, if ever they're going to get them, just to come here and get a better degree in law and learn American law. they got to do all of that stuff. And if you just show up at the border, you can walk across the nonsense. Obviously, the federal government is not doing its job. What the Constitution says is that the states delegated that authority to protect their borders to the federal government. The question is, what do you do when it stop doing that? As a member of Congress, for sure, I'm not voting for dime one ever again until the border is closed, until the laws that are on the books are enforced. The Congress can do that. Now, and certainly as a congressman, I would partner with the state attorney general to do whatever a congressman can to create the room and the protection and the cover and the advocacy uh, to do what Texas can to secure its own border. Thank you. John? If anyone needs to borrow the Constitution to follow along with the questions, just, just let me know. <laughs> <laughs> I've got it right here. Uh, the left are easy to understand. They always do what's in their own self-interest. 
And right now, a no borders policy is in their self-interest. Thank goodness that we had Greg, uh, Governor Abbott, Governor DeSantis send those buses out to them because when they felt the pain, just a tiny bit of the pain, who screamed the loudest at President Biden? It was the mayors of these uh, sanctuary cities. We need to make sure that we stand strong against them because they will always act in their own self-interest. And that means that we don't let anything go forward until action is taken on the border. And if that means a government shut down for a period of time, then so be it. Because when it's shut down long enough for their constituents to start feeling the pain, those uh, they're going to come to the negotiating table faster than you can imagine because you saw it with these, with these buses. So no action until border action is taken. We've got to make sure the left feels that pain. Thank you, Scott. John? Yeah, so the border is completely broken and wide open. It was absolutely done intentionally by this administration. You know how I know that? Because I went to the border in November and I talked to Border Patrol agents who were very free with their opinions. They could fix this crisis tomorrow. They know what to do and the Biden administration won't let them. And you have to ask why. And really, I think it's simple. They are trying to destabilize our country and our way of life with mass illegal in, 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 and a huge flow of drugs. It's real simple, we have to stop it. The next Congress has to do some, some really easy things. It's not gonna be, uh, it's not complex. Number one, it reads to remain in Mexico. If you come across the border and you ask for asylum, you have to stay in your country of origin until your case is adjudicated. Number two, declare war on the drug cartels. We have to treat them with the operational efficiency that the cartels are operating under as well. Number three, we have to revisit birthright citizenship. It is crazy that you can walk across the southern border and have a baby who has the full privileges of citizenship immediately. Number four, we have to deport the illegals. I'm sorry, we've got 1.6 million, million final orders of removal outstanding that the Biden administration has not processed. We need to process them. We have to impeach my orcas. This man has failed intentionally. We have to get him out of office. And for heaven's sakes, we have to elect a Republican president so we can start fixing this problem day one in a new administration in 2025. Thank you, John. Thank you. Again, ditto for all that. <laughs> Another thing that I look at that I put some blame on in our news media. I don't think the message is getting out. We talked about earmarks earlier. That's nothing compared to what the cost it is going to be for the American people with this migration. What's going to, how it's going to hurt our economy, of, of, of our social programs and things of that nature. It's going to be a huge dollar amount that's going to cost every one of us. And that needs to be, be very loud from the news media, but it's not being reported on how this is going to impact every one of us. If, if that, that message got out, there would be a demanding Joe Biden to stop the border and things would be happening. But there, the people are not educated how much that's going to hurt our country. Thank you, Joe. <laughs> Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I am a legal immigrant. I came here in 1990 with my family, and I got my citizenship while serving in the Navy. I enlisted in 2000. Thank you, sir. Uh, I joined with a green card, and I renounced my Indian citizenship to become an American citizen. Trust me, I know what it means to be an immigrant and love this country. I, I got a statistic for you. Do you know that since Biden took office, more people have crossed the border illegally than have been born in the United States? It's the first time it's happened in history. And you want to talk about um, you know, Article 1, Section 10, let's bring up the Fourth Amendment. We have a fact where they're actually housing people who are military-aged men. They're kicking out homeless vets to make room for illegal aliens. You have more people who cross the border in October than the entire city of Garland, Texas. And on top of that, let me tell you this, it's being done by design. It's called the Declaration of North America. Biden signed this earlier this year. And what it did was that it basically said, every migrant is here because of climate change and they're an asylum. I will take 30 more seconds, man, because this is so important. Right now, there's a difference between immigration and invasion. We are facing an invasion. So day one, I'm gonna issue a bill, as an immigrant, 
as a legal immigrant, as a citizen, as a representative, we're going to need to have a six-month moratorium on all immigration. That is the only way we're going to fix the issue. And you know what the wait time is for legal immigrants who've come here? To go from green card, to get their green card 200 years. This is crazy. And look, I, I am not a congressman, I'm, 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 I haven't held elected office, but I am mad as heck. And I'm tired of our country is being ripped apart. Thank you, Bert. Okay, well, the last and final question, and then everyone will get their two minutes except Bert. He will get less. <laughs> <laughs> I dug, no, it's okay, I dug it, I dug it. Okay, so we will do our last one. Wise County conservatives asked this question. And uh, Dr. Nina, this will go to you first, and then wrap around. One, okay. No, actually, it's just one question. We're good. What is your view on the Tenth Amendment to the U.S. Constitution? Y'all knew this was coming up, right? <laughs> Does it still have relevance to the federal and state government relations, and if so, how? Yeah. So this is a very critical part of um, you know, our Bill of Rights. And I would say that you know, Texas um, as a state has done a lot to try to prevent all this migrant invasion that's actually happening. Uh, it's a very sad thing because all the fentanyl coming across, I've had to put in fentanyl training for our students like overnight because a neighboring district had three deaths uh, from just taking one pill. So the, the issue is huge and luckily our district was, you know, was, was good and I pushed it to, you know, save the kids and, uh, you know, get away from this whole business. But um, one of the things is that I think that the states have a lot more power than they realize and I think uh, we are not using our innovation and our technology and our resources appropriately to bring in the change that we actually want to see across this border problem. Thank you, Dr. Nina. Okay. Come on up here, Doug. All right. Let me know if you need me to reread the question. Please. So I know what Article 10 is. Every, every right that's not granted to the uh, federal government is supposed to be reserved to the states. Is that correct? Okay, yeah. paraphrase. <laughs> but my answer is, I, on, said it that, I said it in the last in the answer to the last one, which was family law was explicitly reserved to the states. Every issue in family law, including, and that's in the, if you read the Federalist Papers, they say that, all the founders, including things like what's marriage, including things like right to life, including things like how do we educate our children? Those should all be Texas issues and Texas people should decide. And we could start with, and there's another thing about the education, we could abolish the Federal Education Agency. We should abolish the State Education Agency. It should be run by the local people here with the community values here, and that is a traditional and very effective way so that our community values of this particular Vice County will govern how you raise your kids. Thank, Thank you, you. Dad. Brandon? One of the biggest problems in our country right now, I think, is the weaponization of government against conservatives and against Christians. And that happens in two ways. One of the, re one of the reasons that's happening is that Washington has usurped powers that were specifically delineated by the Constitution to be given to the states. The second reason is that Congress has created agencies and it has abdicated its, its, its authority to oversee these agencies. I'm thinking of things like the FBI, the ATF, the CIA, and others. And it will not oversee them, so they exist for their own sake. And they have been weaponized by the left to target conservatives and Christians, like we were talking about. I think that one, the Department of Education should be abolished. I think that the ATF should be abolished. It's being weaponized to infringe upon our Second Amendment rights. I think that we need to be defunding the FBI, and we need to be defunding the EPA, and we need to, frankly, we could defund quite a few other agencies, but one of the reasons is that Congress has abdicated that authority and they need to take it back. Thank you, Brandon. 
absolutely agree. How does this whole thing work, right? I'm an immigrant, this is why I love being here, because there's God, there's people, there's states, and then there's the federal government. That's what the 10th Amendment means. That what the states haven't delegated to the federal government to do because they can't do it themselves better belongs to the states. We're facing days ahead where the federal government has failed. I mean, going to fail. Oh, it's failed. Look at the budget. It's failed. No, we're never gonna, it's never going to pay off. It's 30-something trillion. Who cares? It's a trillion dollars now every three months that's being piled on. It is acting completely lawlessly, right? Look, absolutely we should disband things like the Department of Education and all of these agencies to which Congress has abandoned its responsibility. And that's what I'm offering. I'm offering something that I know what it looks like when you live in a state where the federal government's out of control, country where it's out of control, and to be there to protect Texas in the trying times that are coming ahead, when we're gonna have to renegotiate our bargain with the federal government. And what I can offer is my experience as a lawyer, my background, and absolutely the exercise of the 10th Amendment. Thank you. Thank you, Glenn. Well, the federal government has successfully encroached upon our rights to the point to where uh, the states don't even realize the power that they still have. And the, many of us don't realize the powers that we have under the Ninth, ninth Amendment. They started doing this systematically. I, I, for one, would like to see them repeal the 17th Amendment, which allows senators to be elected by popular vote and not appointed by the states, because that took away a lot of the states' ability to have control in this in this deal. So we've come to the point now with the federal government being so about themselves, so insulated as incumbents, that we need things like term limits amendment, which I support, balanced budget amendment, which I support, uh, and, and a restoration from the states to take back their control. Hopefully this new bill giving Texas a, a, the ability to enforce immigration laws is a test case to further reassert states' authorities for their own government, governance. And I fully support us continuing to, to fight for that, shrink the federal government back down, get it focused on the only things it should be responsible for, and let us locally take care of the rest. Thank you, Scott. John? Yeah, they're actually absolutely right. The states have completely abdicated their constitutional roles. The federal government is supposed to work for the states, not the other way around. And I think it's important to focus on the mechanism that the federal government uses to usurp that power and to ultimately usurp our freedoms, and that is a weaponized administrative state. Washington, D.C. Is, is full of a permanent weaponized bureaucratic class who you didn't vote for, who doesn't think it works for you, paid by your tax dollars, by the way, and you can't fire. They stay in D.C. and they write the rules. So I'm a, I'm a, I own a construction company. I'm a recovering lawyer. Went to Georgetown for law school and in private practice. I worked in healthcare, analyzing regulations that were being propagated under Obamacare. These weren't passed by Congress. These were written by bureaucrats that don't like you and that don't like their, your way of life and that want to keep you under their thumb. And none of this gets any better until we dismantle the weaponized administrative state. And we're going to start doing that in January of 2025. Thank you, John. Joel? Uh, I agree with almost everything said. You know, the states need to take more, more control back from our federal government. And also, we need to have more severe penalties for people in those agencies, those federal employees that are lying and acting on known falsehoods. Severe penalties, not a slap in the face or a demotion. We're talking about prison time, we're talking about no pension, we're talking about 10% of your net worth. Something so severe, so when we know a federal employee or a politician is saying something to us or acting on our behalf, we know it is for the truth. We need more accountability, not only in our politicians, from, but from every employee in the government. Every police officer, everybody that works for us, we need the truth, and we need to know that we are having the truth, and they're acting for us. And there needs to be severe penalties, because we cannot rely on the oath. This is not gun smoke anymore. Thank you. Thank you, John. 
We are one nation under God, not government. Period. And what we saw happen during COVID was the single largest overreach of government that I've ever seen in my entire life. Our constitutional liberties were treated like a wet rag. When it came from mandates from OSHA with the president ruling by executive order and the Supreme Court deciding its constitutionality, Congress has abnegated its responsibilities. We have government agencies that have run amok. Victoria Newland has been in government making wrong decisions since 2000, and yet she still has a job. We need to gut federal agencies. We need to get rid of the Department of Education. We have to get rid of the ATF. We have to cut 60% of the FBI that are not agents. We have to ensure that the Tenth Amendment is paramount, and the Ninth Amendment on top of that is paramount, because I argue the Ninth Amendment is more important than the Tenth Amendment because it protects all of our laws. In addition to that, day one, you wanna know what I'm gonna do? Day one issue a bill to repeal the Patriot Act. Thank you, Bill. Jason? I think it's the thing to say, I agree with everyone here. I told the group back there, if I were to hang out with these guys and have a coke, uh, we'd probably would enjoy our company and we all agree on most everything. Um, I have a different tack, and mine is this. I'm up here because Republicans are losing. We've been losing for a while now. And it's come to the point where we're the frog in the water and they keep throwing in a little bit more, a little bit more, our freedoms watching them run away. We need a different tactic. We saw the way that President Trump showed up against them and he's still taking a beating to this moment. The lesson I learned from that is this. What's it gonna to take to fight? We have to fight, fight hard on all fronts. I don't mean every front possible. I mean all fronts that protect our rights, all front fronts that protect the integrity of the United States. With that, our current congressmen spend on average 100 days in Washington, then they spend the rest of that with their constituents. I'm not that kind of fighter. I will actually be there, I will be there in the fight. Uh, I will connect with my constituents. But more importantly is, why don't we connect with those of like minds uh, in, in the branches of government to see who can actually bring things forward, be whistleblowers, uh, continue the fight. We have to take things very differently. We have to take the approach of being aggressive. This is not politics as usual. Thank you. Before we get to your two minutes, and Ms. Deb will give you your cues as normal, I just want to thank you guys for being up here, ladies and gentlemen. I will say, from an outsider looking in, as a small mayor, small town mayor, I'm proud to see every one of you up here. You all share the same passion and drive. It's the first time I've seen in a long time, if y'all agree. It is impressive, and I, I pray for success on all of you. I think that's really great. So I will go ahead and give the mic to Joel to start. Well, you're going to take his mic because i got stuff to say. So uh, I'll have Joel, you'll start the two minute and then we'll go on down. Thank you. Okay, I thank you all. I thank you all for running. Uh, we, I think we're all on the same page up here. Okay? Myself, I think what makes me different, I think I have a plan. It's a plan that I started long before I know Dr. Burgess was leaving. And that, and that plan was to unite America. We all use the word indivisible when we give the Texas pledge, the U.S. flag, and it really concerns me that how divided we are. We have so many things coming down to the world, AI and China, and for us to compete and for us to beat those things, we need to be united. So how are we going to be united? For one thing, I think we need to start and have a common ground. And one of the things I think we all need to do and start this now before our values change is that we all, Democrats and Republicans, say, hey, let's have the truth. I want the truth. I need the truth. I want accountability. I want accountability. How are we going to have the truth? We need to, first of all, we need to have a news agency that gives us the truth. We need a news agency that's accountable for the truth. We all will act differently if we have different stimuli. It's, it's just the way our brain works. Us Republicans are not, should not be fighting Democrats. We are one country. What we need to do is make sure we have the same stimulus. And the stimulus is the truth. I believe my conservative values Will, upheld, will be upheld by the truth. 
And I believe that there's Democrats who will be moving to be Republicans if they were given the truth. So we have to get our news agencies or develop a news agency to give the truth. We don't need to be fighting, fighting, fighting. We need to be united. And we can be united with the truth, accountability, and responsibility. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, once again, my name is Bert Thacker. I am a United States Navy veteran. I work in construction. I'm a Jeopardy champion. And uh, I uh, love our country. Our country. Um, my boots are, are dirty, and I'll keep them dirty throughout the election, because one of the things I did to get on the ballot was I door knocked for 10 days and a door knocked on over a thousand homes to get over 500 signatures. And so there's dirt from Decatur, there's mud from Munster, there's soil from Sanger. I can, and I met so many people, I met so many of us that have the same issues. You see, I'm, I'm blue collar, I, I have a job. And I got tired of paying $600 for health insurance. I got tired of the fact that we could spend $200 billion to Ukraine within a nanosecond, but we can't find $3 billion to fix a wall. I got tired of the fact that you can vote in a federal election without a federal ID. I got tired of the fact that you have China, which is encroaching our borders and is able to buy farmland left, right, and center, but you can't even, as an 18 year old, you're allowed to take out a mortgage for a home when it comes to a college degree, but at 25, you can't take out a $15,000 loan for your small business. This isn't freedom. This isn't the American dream. This is the American nightmare. And it's perpetuated by Joe Biden and his cronies, which started under Obama. Let's just be real. I am a conservative. I believe in a smaller federal government. We have 5,400 laws. Why? We have unelected bureaucrats that tell us what to do. And I read a book called Three Felonies a Day, where the average American will commit three felonies a day, according to the current laws. This is not freedom. Sir, the Second Amendment is the reason why all the other amendments exist. And yet we're finding out day by day that our Bill of Rights gets trampled upon every day. I believe in term limits. I'm tired of rich people getting into office or people born into political families. And it's time for America to be run by Americans. And you want to know how great this country is? Let me tell you something. A, a kid who grew up in the foothills of the Himalayas could be running for the Congress of the United States of America. That's pretty dang cool. Thank you, Barry. Jason. I want to thank everybody for coming out here tonight. I know that's typically what, what's said, but um, since I've been running as a candidate, I've really begun to appreciate you. The ones that show up, the ones that are not just educated, but you're doing something. You inspire me. So um, with that being said, my legitimate question to you is, how do you decide? I mean, how do you choose between the candidates up here? And it's a bit of a, a, a hard line, because like I said, I really like everybody that's up, to you, up here. So how do you discern? Is it character, charisma, what they say on stage, how quaff their hair is? I don't know. But what I can tell you is this. The reason I'm standing up here is the reason, probably the same reason that you're sitting there. I just had enough. I could not take one bit more of what the federal government is doing to us. And my concern is this, and my, unfortunately my prediction is this, we are at the tipping point. As they not only weaponize the government, but they collude with big tech to take away our voice. We're, on the, we're at the, at, right on the edge, the tipping point, where if we do not act up and act up aggressively in every possible way, we're going to lose this country in the short term. So, Democrats have been playing the long game for a while. I have no idea what Republicans are playing. Honestly, I mean, they're like, they're like, like in, in the ring with the rope dump. They're just getting knocked around. I honestly cannot tell you what their strategy is. So from my perspective, one of the things I want to do is I want to get to D.C. To, to talk with not just fellow congressmen, which would be great, but also to talk with others that are, are of similar mind so that we can start to build a strategy for how we can handle these things from the federal level. And then I'm a community builder. I want to build community with uh, other groups like the ones that are hosting tonight to do like I did with churches. We're not at war with each other. We are on the same side. Let's start sharing resources, sharing knowledge, help one another beyond the partisan stuff within the Republican Party. That we can readily do. We have that available to us. You just have to stop thinking like a politician. I'm not up here as a politician. I don't care about 
winning the next election. I care about doing what I said I'm going to do on this platform. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so this has been very interesting for me. Thank you for showing up this evening and supporting us. Um, thank you to you too. It's been wonderful. Um, I'd like to say that uh, I'm not a person who just talks, and that has been my path throughout life. When I get tired of something, I take action, and I just don't talk about it. When they told me they don't have doctors in the rural areas, you know what, I signed up even though I had to leave my family, go and spend many, many years and serve the veterans or people of that community and did it with, you know, with all my dedication. And I did that as well in the rural communities of Texas. I have also worked in different hospital systems in the state of Texas, and we are very blessed in this country to have such wonderful health care. I, as a proponent, as a medical physician, can stand up to healthcare, whether it's Medicare, Medicaid, elderly care, which I'm a geriatrician, and also practice hospice and internal medicine. So this is, this is my lifeblood. So I can talk about that, and I can talk about the signs, whether, it's, whether this is a woman, whether this is a man, where is the uterus, yes, I can talk about that. And I think it's time for the Republican Party to change its views a little bit and maybe bring in some new fresh blood or new people such as me who will bring in some voice of reason and bring in consensus. I was able to do that very successfully in my local school board where I was the only conservative voice that prevented vocism from taking over our school district. I had to fight hard but I did it very well. I was actually placed in a newspaper saying that she is a team of one. And I can tell you, I did not talk about it during COVID. I went and I took action and I supported my school district. I also believe in term limits and I don't talk about it just like that. After I was done with my school district service, which was on May 22nd, 2023, I did not run again because I believe that running for this office was way more important than for me to run for my school district again. I hope you will come out and give me your vote, especially the women of the Republican Party. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Neen. <laughs> I'm gonna end this how I started, which was, yeah, there's this guy with gray hair. He's running, all right? And the big question is why? Well, there was a country preacher, remind me of Mo, uh, told me this story. There's an old man sitting by a creek. And he was building this bridge. And a young man came up to this old man and said, why are you doing this, old man? You're not going to be able to use this bridge. He said, no, I'm not. But you are, and your children are. And their children are, so we better build a beautiful, big bridge. And I've lived my life, and I'm, I'm Christian, I've always been a Christian. Luke 12, 48, those who have been given much are required to do much. Much to those who have much has been entrusted, even more is demanded. We, as this society, it demands that we leave a America that is better than we have, and one of the ways to do that, and now I'll get into specifics on how we're going to build that bridge. Number one, enforce the law that's there, the immigration law, the law, the Constitution, the Second Amendment. By the way, if there's any doubt about where I stand on the Second Amendment, I carry it. <laughs> so, you know, actions speak louder than words. Um, and we must rein in the federal government. 32 billion in debt. I said that what are we leaving our children? We need to eliminate these federal agencies that are wasteful. We can start with education. We've got to take a long look at housing and urban development. We've got to take a long look at the Commerce Department. We've got to take a long look at the EPA. 
and we got to take a long look at other agencies. Those are concrete actions to build that bridge. Thank you. Thank you, Don. Brandon. The number one reason that I'm running for U.S. Congress here is that our country right now is at war. It's an ideological battle between the right and between the left. On the right side, which is all of you guys here, we want small government, we want constitutional conservatism, and we want a social environment where the Christian faith can thrive. The left side wants big government, they want socialism, and they want atheism. And that's, just be very clear about that. One of the problems that are, one of the reasons I should say that our country is in such a terrible position right now, whether it's open borders or inflation raging or perverts trying to go into women's bathrooms and locker rooms, um, or crime in our, in our cities allowing Black Lives Matter and other organizations to burn our cities down to the ground. One of the reasons that we're, we're facing this right now is because Republicans, the old guard Republican establishment, hasn't realized that we're at war right now. They've sat on the sidelines and they've paid lip service to the radical left while they are burning down our country. And it's time for that to end. I'll give you a couple examples. One of them is the 2020 election. And I think that we have to be extremely, extremely clear and unambiguous about what happened. The 2020 election was stolen from Donald Trump. He should be in the White House right now. And I know that because I helped make a movie called 2000 Mule that exposed massive ballot traffic in the operation all over this country. The second thing is they're trying to do it again. They're taking him off the ballot in Maine. They're trying to take him off the ballot in Colorado. And I can bet you they're going to try it in other states as well. And we need Republicans who realize what the left is doing and will actually fight back. And I'll tell you one thing. I think one of the reasons President Trump endorsed me is because he knows I will fight like crazy to help him make sure he's on the ballot and help pass his agenda in Washington. But I think that one thing we, we've got to realize is we cannot go back to the ways of the old guard GOP because we absolutely will lose this country. I love this country so much, and we can win this battle, but we have to fight, and I'm going to fight. So thank y'all for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank everybody for hanging in there. It's been a long night. A lot of words said. Again, I'm Vlad. Um, what can I tell you? As I said before, I've lived under communism in a police state. And you've probably met other immigrants like me. And you've probably noticed that we're all extremely allergic to what's going on and became worried a lot long before Americans did because we've lived it and we see it coming. So what you've heard tonight is population replacement. So let me just step one. None of this is accidental. None of this is like a bug in the federal government system that somehow got out of control. It's a feature, it's intentional. There's population replacement, there's corruption, our country's being robbed through inflation, and everything is being done with the uh, monetary system. And of course, what's DEI? What is all of this stuff? It, the first step, I'm not the first guy to tell you about it, is to confuse you is to disconnect you from your traditional values to make right, wrong, turn things upside down so that we can insert, the left can insert crazy new ideas in. But these aren't ideas. These are just things designed to shatter your system so that whoever wants to, the minority that can't get to power through majority vote, can get in and get its goodies. Now you've got a lot of foreign enemies. There is no rival to the United States right now that isn't just celebrating. Whether it's in Moscow, whether it's in Beijing, having a great time. Our country's in disarray. Our federal government has failed. It's spending itself into bankruptcy. And they're planning to make problems for us worse than we have now. What I'm offering is that I've lived that experience. I've lived in a weaponized, underneath a weaponized government, being surveilled 24-7. I came here to escape that. It breaks hearts in my heart to see it happen. I'm a lawyer. I've gone to Stanford. Guys writing these subpoenas to search in Mar-a-Lago are my classmates. I have had enough, like has been said by others, and I fully agree with everything everybody said. It's delighted to be in the company of sane people and good Americans. What I'm offering you guys is me to go tell the truth, stand up with integrity, and defend the United States. Thank you, Brad. So a month ago, I was pretty much minding my own business. 
I had a pretty good life. My daughters are juniors at Texas A&M. Sorry about that, sir. <laughs> but, uh, uh, and, and things were going well. My uh, period of public service ended a long time ago, about 20 years ago. And I assumed that that part of my life was completed. And then we got the news about Dr. Burgess. And that, say, that old passion started coming back. And then I started thinking about Washington. And then the old blood started to boil. There's an old army axiom that says, if you got the votes, vote them. Well, there's been time over the last 20 years where we've had the votes and we did nothing. The last time we actually reduced the national debt was in 2001, and it was $3.3 trillion. And we were concerned about that number. Today, it's $34 trillion because Congress, almost all of them, decided it was better to go uh, uh, get their pork and get their piece of it because it allowed them to stay in office. And that's where we come to today. So we've got the votes right now in the House. We got the votes to vote them. In 2017, they had the votes, they did nothing. I wanna make sure that in 2025, I believe we're gonna have a Republican Senate again. We're gonna hold the Republican House and we're gonna have a Republican President. And I wanna make sure that when we have those votes, we, we are voting them. First, to stand strong until action is taken on the border. And then once we get that, I want to dig into my real passion, which is tackling this out of control debt and, uh, and deficit. It's a crisis that is 100% created by Congress, and Congress is the only, the only ones who can fix it. It's their exclusive responsibility, because no spending is done except what comes out of the House of Representatives and approved, uh, and approved by both, both, both houses. That's the work they have to do that they've neglected for far too long, and that's the hard grinding work that I'm going to do to work for you to take action. I'm not going to measure my success by how much money I bring back to the district, sorry, uh, but I think you appreciate that. And I'm not going to measure my success by how many Facebook followers I have. I'm going to measure my success by how much we can reduce this debt and get fiscal responsibility back into this federal government. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Well, hey, thank you guys so much for being here and sticking with us. You guys are the real heroes of this. It means so much to all of us on the stage that you have sat here and listened to us and that you're taking the time to be engaged. We really appreciate it. Seriously. My name is John Huffman. Uh, as Mayor of Southlake, I have fought for and won important conservative victories on all the things that we care the most about, whether it's fighting back against DEI and CRT, or balancing budgets, or cutting taxes, or cutting regulations on small businesses. I've done it, and experience matters. Because you don't have to guess what I will do, because you can see what I've done. And the next Congress that takes office which with, I pray, a Republican president, is going to do so with a razor-thin Republican majority. And you need to send a proven conservative fighter to Washington, D.C. to make sure your interests and all of our families are protected. I'm running for Congress because I've got three teenagers, and my wife and I are about to launch them out into the world, and honestly, it's pretty scary. It's pretty scary to see this America that, frankly, a lot of us don't recognize. And my kids are looking at this, and they are looking for their own American dream, and what they are finding is the Biden nightmare with a broken border and out of control inflation and trillions and trillions of dollars of deficits every year, it is not working and it's intentional. But, but I don't think God is done with this country yet and I know you guys agree because you're here. So let's elect a proven conservative fighter, let's go to Washington DC and let's start winning some victories for our way of life because that matters. I'm John Huffman, I would love your vote for Congress on March 5th. Thank you all for being here tonight, it means a lot. Thank you, John. Please, if you can, give these amazing folks who sat through this whole night a round of applause. And also, give them a chance to meet you, greet you. I'm going to say it again. They're running. If you love what one of them said or all of them said, find ways to support them. You can share their Facebook, like their Facebook, donate, whatever you feel led to do. But as a congregation, we should all support and do our part as well. So thanks for hosting, Monica.
Thank you to Crystal Cardwell. Give her a hand. Thank you all for coming. You were dismissed. You are a candidate and you left push cards. If you just go and collect yours before you leave, that would be great. Thank you all so much.